Chapter 1 Perhaps the High Kaidans wanted the Sangheili to remain divided and weak. That was the only explanation Arbiter Thel Vadam could imagine for their squabbling and intransigence, for putting their own interests above the need to stand strong and united. Did they truly expect the tyrant's peace to protect Sangheili space from the encroachments of the Jerohanai and the Kigyar? To overcome mercenary legions, covenant remnants, and any last vestiges of the San Shayum? That was a sand song. Even the tyrant Cortana and her army of artificial intelligence spies could not watch every asteroid in every system could not turn back every moon grab at the edge of every sector. Only the Sangheili themselves could protect their colonies, and only if they came together to create a concert of worlds so capable that no thief would dare test it. But the Sangheili had lived under the deceptions of the Covenant for more than two thousand orbits, and they had grown complacent. Their kaidons had forgotten how easily prosperity could be stolen, how swiftly a keep could become a prison. Now, instead of learning from their recent history, they accepted the tyrant's lies as fact and trusted her despotism to protect the holdings of their clans. They were fools. The Covenant had kept order not just because of its strength, but because of its unity. Its Sen Shayum hierarchs had used religious fables to bring together its member species, promising that all true believers would ascend to divine transcendence. Cortana offered no such hope. She brought only fear and subjugation, and she promised nothing but death to those who defied her. How could the High Kaidans not see that Cortana's hand was already on their throats? She was crushing all that made the Sangheili strong, their discipline and honor and courage, and the Kaidons were happy to let her, so long as she allowed them to believe they were still masters of their own worlds. The Krav in which Vadam was riding came to an abrupt stop, then sat hovering on its propulsion field. He grabbed a plasma repeater off the cabin wall and opened the rear firing port, they had stopped in the cramped confines of the old burrow. A maze-like warren of narrow lanes lined by stone domiciles with no windows on the ground floor. It was an ideal place for an ambush. And given the divisions of the high gathering today, Vadam was certainly ready for one. In Sangheili culture, assassination was the customary way to settle disagreements with authority. And as the reigning arbiter, Vadam was the closest thing the Sangheili had to a supreme leader. That was why he had elected to send his phantom ahead as a decoy, and covertly return home in an armored ground racer. When Vadam saw no threats in the street behind the Krav, he glanced forward. His two escorts sat opposite him on rear-facing saddles. They were peering out through the side-door firing ports, their reddish helmets tipping and rocking as they searched nearby rooftops for firebomb casters and plasma cannons. It was almost unthinkable for a Sangheili to use such weapons to assassinate a superior, but that did not make it impossible. During the blooding years, the Sangheili civil war that had erupted after the Covenant fell, Vadam's enemies had done many unthinkable things to their own kind. At times, Vadam wondered if he had as well. But no attack came. The partition at the front of the passenger cabin descended into its pocket, revealing Vadam's adjunct, Entho Srom, in the drop deck operator's compartment. Like Vadam himself, the young warrior wore no armor, only a belted red tunic that covered his Saurian body to the knees. His pebbly brown face and golden eyes were less oval than most, and his four mandibles a little shorter than the Sangheili norm. Have no alarm, Arbiter, Srom said. His head was half-turned so that one diamond-shaped pupil was looking back and up into the passenger cabin. It is only a tyrant checkpoint. Vadam leaned down so he could look through the forward view screen. A trio of the tyrant's armagers stood in the lane, blocking the way. 
Standing a full head taller than most Sangheili warriors, they had bipedal frames that resembled nothing quite so much as disarticulated suits of armor. Here and there a ghostly orange light limbed the edge of a silvery plate or shone through a seam. A similar glow showed through the eye and mouth openings of their masked helmets, creating the impression of sinister-looking faces. Vadam knew without looking that another squad would be stepping into the street behind the craft, emerging from its hiding place to block any retreat attempt. Whether armagers were purely robotic or sentient-infused hybrids remained unclear to him, but he had no doubts about their effectiveness. They were forerunner-designed constructs fabricated many millennia ago, presumably to police civilizations deemed lower than that of the armager's makers, and they executed their tasks with ruthless and cold efficiency. They wielded advanced forerunner energy weapons like light rifles and suppressors, and they knew how to use both assets to maximum tactical advantage. Some were even quicker than human Spartans. It made Vadam's skin burn to see the tyrant's forces patrolling his ancestral home in the Vadam Valley, but he did not dare destroy them. She would only send more, and when he destroyed those, she would send a guardian. And for a guardian, Vadam had no answer. No one did. Constructed by the forerunners to impose order in their ancient ecumen, guardians were so powerful they could destroy a planet's infrastructure in mere moments. Now the tyrant employed them as weapons of terror, using them to enforce her peace as she had just three days earlier at Doisak. When she used them to punish the defiance of the banished warmaster Atriox by destroying the homeworld of the entire Jirohanai species. Vadam considered Atriox a looming threat and the Jirohanai in general his potential enemies. But the last thing he wanted was the tyrant imposing her peace on them. Because if she was willing to use her guardians against Doisak, she was willing to use them against Sang Helios and no one knew how to neutralize them. The only hope Vadam could see was to overwhelm her forces with a grand alliance of interstellar civilizations. But he had no prospect of making that happen. He could not even unite the worlds of the Sangheili, much less those of the other spacefaring species. When Srom crept the crav hovering in place, the lead armager approached the left side of the operator's compartment and pointed to the ground, ordering him to kill the propulsion field. The armager's armor was more white than their typical silver, and the light shining out through its eye and mouth openings was yellow rather than orange, with its head armor fanning out to both sides. It was an officer, probably the squad leader. The second and third armagers remained in front of the vehicle, their light rifles pointed at the forward view screen. This does not look like a normal checkpoint, Srom said, speaking over his shoulder and ignoring the lead armager's order. Perhaps we should push through. It could be an arrest action. If so, they already know who we are and they will be ready to stop us, said Kola Beoth, a ranger who often served Vedam as an escort. Beoth wore the red-orange armor of the Swords of Sanghelios. Once an alliance of keeps that was the closest thing the Sangheili had had to a central government, the Swords of Sanghelios were now a group of forces united under Vadam's leadership in pursuit of the same ideals as the original Swords, a formal union of all Sangheili worlds. We should not give them an excuse to turn it into an execution. Let us hear what they want, said Use Taham, the second escort. Before the blooding years, he had been known as one of the deadliest special operations commandos in the Covenant. Now Taham served Vadam in a variety of roles. Today he was both advisor and escort, and he wore armor identical to Beoth's. If it comes to a fight, it will be better to leave the crowd. Agreed, Vadam said. Manufactured by Iruru Armory in western Yermo, the Krav was essentially an incognito armored personnel carrier designed for the low-profile transport of civilian dignitaries. 
In place of weapons mounts, it had a reinforced cabin large enough to carry six individuals, and the armor could deflect the strikes of most portable plasma cannons. But against the kind of hard light and antimatter artillery the armagers could call into action, it was a soft target. Keep the propulsion field active, Vadam continued, but be prepared to depart the vehicle. Use, you will see what they want. As you command. Taham waited until Srom had unlatched the driver's canopy and Beoth had unsealed the door on his side of the compartment, then lifted his own door partially open and called out, You can speak to me. I am leaving the vehicle. The officer raised its light rifle and retreated a single pace into the lane. Tahan lifted the door the rest of the way and, leaving his plasma repeater in its mount, stepped out of the crowd. Why have you stopped us? Taham asked calmly. He was standing between the officer and the crowd's open door, but the armager was so tall it could peer over his helmet into the passenger compartment. I am traveling with Arbiter Thel Vadam, and this delay is placing his safety in danger. What is the nature of this danger? The officer's voice was crisp and monotone, but its Sangheili was as proper and precise as a diplomat's. Do you flee someone? No. We are traveling in disguise and taking a secondary route so we will have no need to flee anyone. It is a standard practice to protect against assassination attempts. Then you are expecting an assassination attempt? Not at all, Taham said. We are prepared for one. There is a difference. Explain this difference. As the officer spoke, it continued to peer over Tahan's helmet into the passenger compartment. The second armager remained in front of the crav while the third stepped around to Beoth's side of the vehicle. Vadam was beginning to feel like a gat trapped in a barn full of terrets. Taham had already confirmed Vadam was in the vehicle, and the officer was still trying to get a look inside. Either it thought Taham was lying, or it was looking for someone else. The difference is this, Vadam replied, moving forward to place himself in full view. It is better to be prepared for an attack that never comes than to be surprised by the one that does. But you know that. Otherwise you would not have taken the time to put us into a crossfire before demanding to search our vehicle. Then you intend to cooperate with our search, the officer asked. That depends on what you are looking for, Vadam said, and whether you are truthful in your answer. There has been a street fight with a number of casualties, the officer said. We are searching for those responsible. Do we appear to have been involved in a common street fight, Taham demanded. This is the arbiter of the Sangheili. Stand aside and let him return to his keep. The officer continued to peer over Taham's helmet at Vadam and said, You have been provided a truthful answer. What follows next is your decision. We will consent to your search, Vadam answered quickly. Armagers thought and communicated with the speed of artificial intelligences, so even the tiniest delay might be taken as a prelude to combat. And given what had just happened to Doisak, he was taking no chances. Allow us to leave the vehicle, and you may look inside. Your cooperation will be noted, the officer said. Proceed. Srom deactivated the crab's propulsion field and climbed out of the operator's compartment. Then Vadam and Beoth returned their plasma repeaters to the wall mounts and stepped out on Taham's side of the vehicle. The four Sangheili were now armed with only the energy swords hanging on their belts. But if they found themselves in a sudden close-quarters fight, it would be their swords they wanted. The armager officer retreated a few steps to keep all four Sangheili in its firing arc. The second armager remained in front of the crowd, while the third, on the side opposite the Sangheili, ducked through the open door to inspect the passenger cabin. Vadam glanced up the lane behind the vehicle and was not surprised to see that a fourth and fifth armager had now emerged from hiding. They were setting up a monopod-mounted splinter turret. 
a fearsome infantry weapon that fired projectiles of fragmenting hard light. That must have been quite the street fight, Vadam remarked, looking toward the splinter turret. Light artillery is not usually required to handle such a situation. A tenement island was badly damaged, the officer replied. The survivors may need another home. We have been tasked with preventing a similar incident. The tenement islands of Vadam Valley were large compounds where the forge working clans in service to the Kolar Manufactorum lived. Unlike the single brood merchant domiciles that lined the old borough's transit lanes, the tenement islands housed hundreds of Sanghili and their young. For one to be damaged so badly that it caused fatalities and left the survivors homeless suggested heavy combat. Normally, it would be the Protective Legion of Vadam keep apprehending the combatants and ensuring that no further destruction occurred. But the tyrant's administrator had disarmed and disbanded all keephold forces on Sanghelios, and now the entire world had to rely on the armagers for routine security functions. Even Vadam could see how the High Kaidons might doubt that Cortana would allow his proposed Concert of Worlds to provide the kind of protection they needed. Then put your splinter turret away, Vadam said, returning his gaze to the officer. If you open fire with such a weapon, you will be the cause of another incident. Your concern is noted. We will use only the force necessary to apprehend the instigators. The officer pointed over Vadam's head. The inspection of your vehicle is now complete. You may resume your journey as soon as you surrender the rest of your weapons. Vadam turned and saw the third armager rising from the far side of the crowd, a trio of plasma repeaters stacked in the crook of one arm. It started to step back, then noticed the needle rifle tucked into a scabbard in the operator's compartment and retrieved that too. You want our weapons? Vadam continued to watch as the third armager began to pile them on the street. That is an insult. After tonight's events, the administrator is no longer willing to trust Sanghili with personal weapons, the officer said. Please remove the energy swords from your belts and leave them in the street for immediate disposal. We cannot do that, Beoth said, stepping between Vadam and the armager. And we will not. The Arbiter must be able to protect himself. Taham stepped to Beoth's side. On this, we will not hold Use. Knowing what would happen if Taham finished his sentence, Vadam clasped his shoulder and pulled him back. We are in no position to offer ultimatums. It is well you recognize that, the officer said. His weapon was pointed at Vadam's chest, but the second armager was aiming his light rifle at the back of Taham's helmet. An ultimatum from the Arbiter would not be allowed to stand. Then listen to reason, Taham said. The Arbiter has many enemies. If he cannot protect himself, the Arbiter is no longer responsible for protecting himself. Nor are you. As the officer spoke, the second armager reabsorbed its light rifle into its arm, then stepped past the crav operator's compartment and reached for the energy sword on Srom's belt. When Srom cast a questioning gaze in Vadam's direction, he let out his breath and nodded. As much as it galled him to yield to the tyrant's minions, he was better than dying in a pointless standoff. Your arbiter's safety is our responsibility now, the lead armager continued, by decree of the Archon Cortana.